Okay, the third law of thermodynamics, really short and sweet. Basically, if I cool things down enough, everything stops moving. It's going to march in place in, in, until I get right down to zero, and then all motion stops. It will be a perfectly ordered crystal with zero volume. Obviously impossible. Perfection is not possible. That means we would have a single microstate. Everything exists in only one position with only one energy. Entropy is zero at that point because ln of one, ln of one is zero. So entropy would be zero, okay? We call that absolute zero because it's the lowest temperature anything can go. It actually can't get there, but we thought it could. So this is an awesome joke. I'm gonna read it. It makes more sense that way. Did you hear about the guy that got frozen to absolute zero? He's okay now. Zero Kelvin, get it? <laughs> okay. So entropy is a measurement of disorder. A lot of the times people say that entropy is chaos and that's not quite it. Disorder and chaos are two different concepts, right? But um, basically it means the more options the particles have, the more entropy they have, okay? And nature tends to like disorder. In the learning check, I want you to fill in what the units are. Try to do it without looking back, see if you can remember. Um, when you think about the entropy of an ice cube versus the entropy of the hand holding the ice cube, why are they not the same? And then finally, the last question on this slide is if we are increasing molecular motion, it causes more microstates, what does that do to entropy? Okay, so this diagram is comparing temperature versus entropy. And so when you're at zero entropy, you have zero volume, zero, really just one microstate, no, choices. <laughs> the temperature is also zero at that point. And then as we increase temperature, we see that we get more and more different states that things can be in. And then suddenly we get to the melting point and jump up in entropy significantly, right? Because you're, you're, you're increasing the types of movement that, uh, that the particles can do. So when you're a solid, it's basically just vibrational. When you become a liquid, you get rotational and a little bit of translational energy too. And so that's why suddenly the entropy, the number of microstates increases dramatically. And then the same sort of slow increase in the liquid phase, you're basically just giving it more energy states to choose from. And then bam, we go way, way, way up in entropy. Again, because you have so much more space between the particles in the gas phase, they have more position options. And now they have a lot of translational energy on top of all the vibrational and rotational. And then once you are a gas, you can keep increasing the number of states for, um, number of energy states that are possible, which will also increase the motion. And so you get an increase of an entropy even after boiling something. So just like in chapter five, where we had standard enthalpy, um, the same appendix we used in chapter five also has standard entropy values, all right? Um, those, the standard means one atmosphere, one mole of whatever at 298 Kelvin, so 25 Celsius. That's what the standard conditions are defined as. Um, but when we were talking about the entropy, uh, sorry, enthalpy of formation for elements, they had a delta H of zero. That is not true for S, okay? So we cannot make assumptions when trying to calculate the change in S. We have to go look at the appendix and use those values listed there, okay? So now just some, some conceptual questions. Uh, we're gonna look at a couple different options here. So the question, how is entropy of a liquid related to its gas form? Well, so let's see, we got these liquids, methanol, benzene, and water. So if we look at water, and we compare it to the gas phase of water, 
what do you notice? Which one has more entropy? Is that what you expected? Same question for methanol, right? Still a pattern. And an even more complicated molecule, benzene. Benzene, as we can see, the same pattern holds true. Okay, so benzene in the liquid phase versus benzene in the gas phase, it, they all have the same pattern. Okay, so what is that pattern? Answer that question in the learning check. All right, so what about molar mass? What do we notice about molar mass? So let's pick two things with similar molar masses. We're going to try to choose the same phase. So, so if we pick, say, I don't know, hydrogen, and we compare it with the heaviest thing on here, which would be benzene, which one has a higher entropy? Of course, it's the benzene, right? And that generally holds true. The heavier the thing is, the higher the delta S will be. That's because the electrons themselves, the protons, the neutrons themselves, the subatomic particles have more options if there are more of them. Okay, so generally speaking, molecular weight increases as entropy increases. Or if you wanna flip that around, entropy gets bigger if molecular weight's getting bigger. Okay, so last comparison, if we're looking at two things with the same molar mass, so roughly the same weight, but different numbers of particles, which one has a greater entropy? So if we just take a look at oxygen and methanol, which both have molar masses of 32 grams per mole, we find that more particles, sorry, more atoms in the particle means higher entropy. That makes sense because you get, you get more types of movement, more stretching, more bending in the vibrational, um, more wiggling around, more rotation also. Um, so, the one I want you to answer on the learning learning check is gas versus liquid, but for the other two, I've given you the answers here. Okay. So back to our friendly re reaction, the Haber-Bosch process. We can calculate the entropy of this reaction in the same way that we were doing uh, using Hess's law in chapter five. So Hess's law just says that if you know the products enthalpy and the reactants enthalpy, you can find the reaction enthalpy. So we wrote that like this. Oops, not S. Hold on. So enthalpy is H. So it's the sum of all the enthalpies of the products minus the sum of, oh, that's a terrible sum sign. That's supposed to be a sigma. Of all the enthalpies of the reactants. All right, and so you remember from that chapter that the coefficients of the reaction have to be included in your sum as well. Okay, if you need to go review, make sure you do. It's chapter five, Hess's Law. Because the same thing can get applied to entropy as it turns out, because they're both state functions. I said earlier, it's only final minus initial that matters. That's what we're doing here. The final enthalpy minus the initial. The final entropy minus the initial. And so these values, are tabulated in the back of the textbook. So I'm going to do this example. I am using our Brown and LeMay textbook to do it. Make sure that you do as well if you use the, the internet. It's, it's liable to give you different conditions, different states, different answers. It's just confusing. So stick with the appendices from our textbook. Um, so these are listed in Appendix C. It's titled thermodynamic quantities. And the one we were using in chapter five is delta H, which is the first column. Um, delta S is the last column for every listing. 
Okay. The other thing that catches people up is that there's actually two different columns. Okay. So check it. You see this one where my fingers are, this is one set of data. And then on the other side of the page is a completely different set of data. Be careful. The other place people get tripped up is by not putting states of matter. So just for example, if you go look at the difference between ammonia liquid and ammonia gas, it's huge because we just said that, remember? Right over here, this last slide, we just said there's a big difference in a liquid and a gas entropy. So be careful of what state you're actually using in any given reaction. And aqueous is different from a liquid. Okay. So what we're going to do is I just like to write the reaction down here with states. Don't get lazy. Whoops. And with coefficients, of course, it has to be balanced. So be careful. Make sure your reaction is right before you start. I really prefer if people write the delta S values before plugging it into the equation, because if you pick the wrong values, I'll be able to quickly see which one was wrong and I can give you credit for the rest. If I have to play detective, I'm probably not going to work very long at it. So that also means if you're not using the same book I am, it's going to be a lot harder for me to grade your work. So be careful. Um, so we're going to look for N2. Remember, to avoid the temptation to say that the entropy is zero, enthalpy, delta H, is zero for an element like N2. But if you look at the entropy, it's not zero. I hope you try this problem before watching me do it, by the way. Always a good strategy. Hydrogen also um, is listed in there. It's not zero, it's 130.58. I'm gonna leave the units off or I'm gonna run out of room. Ammonia is probably gonna list, be listed under nitrogen. It is, and its value is 192.5. Be careful that you don't pick aqueous ammonia. Its value is 111 but that would be wrong. So our overall delta S is gonna be products. So two times the value for each ammonia minus the reactants. I'm gonna make this a bracket properly. So it's 130.58 times three plus 191.50. I can't tell you how frequently people mess up these signs. And the only way I know to make sure you don't is to use a lot of brackets. That helps to avoid dropping the negative sign. Okay. And also go step by step. Don't just skip a whole bunch of, don't just skip around. And so 130.58 times three plus 191.5 gives us 583.24. Now I subtract those two values, right? Oh, I wrote that one wrong. It's 391. Hmm. Weird. Okay, so anyway, 391.74 minus 583.24. Oh no, wait, I was not wrong. I see, I erased in between, I got so confused. Hold on, I was right the first time. That 391 comes from 130.58 times three. Two times 192.5 is actually 385. Whew, glad I fixed that again. <laughs> All right, so we go 385 minus 583.24, and you're going to see we're going to get a negative number, and that's what I meant by be careful of your sign. People always want everything to be a positive number, but it isn't in this case. It's not. And so, and remember that your units come from the top of that column in the textbook, and they're listed as joules per Kelvin. Uh, oh, actually, per mole Kelvin. There we go. 
So this is a very large, very negative change in entropy. So if you were just going to base this on entropy, you would expect this reaction to never occur. Of course, we know it does. Um, the reason it's such a large negative change in entropy is because you have four particles on the left and two particles on the right. And we just said increasing the number of particles is entropically favored. So it would mean that decreasing it would not be favored by entropy. So that means you get a negative entropy. So hopefully this makes sense to you. Hopefully you kind of understand the relationship between number of particles and reduction in chaos here. All right. Um, but that's not the end of the story because again, we want to avoid the habit of calculating a delta S of reaction and saying, oh, reaction over, that's it because it's not that simple. We have to think about what's happening in the universe as a whole. So to do that, so we just calculated delta S of the system. We also need to calculate the delta S of the surroundings, okay? Um, to do that, we have to find the enthalpy of the reaction because remember the delta S is equal to Q of the reverse and Q and H I didn't explicitly remind you of this. I guess this is a good, as good a time as any. But if um, delta H at constant pressure, so in other words, the pressure's not changing. You're not making it go up or down, is equal to Q. So this was from chapter five, right? So if we need to use this equation, we can find the delta H of the reaction in section 5.7. Um, that's using Hess's law. I'm going to give this to you guys as a review. This again is for that same reaction. I want you to show your work to me step by step and please, please, please show me which delta H values you are using for each quantity. So if you get it wrong, I can at least give you some credit. Okay. So tell me what is the delta H of this reaction? Okay. And then by extension, do you know if that means the reaction is spontaneous or not? <laughs> 